God bless his word. Lord Jesus, sometimes um, when your word speaks to us, our soul so wants to reject it even when our spirit needs it. Our flesh, uh, well, it's, it's weak even when our spirit's willing, as your word says. May your word talk to us in, in that we'll never grow old and crusty, never think same old, same old, and never find ourselves in a place of thinking, I know this story or I got this. May your word smash our heart to smithereens tonight, please, God. May the instruction of your word lead us into the next um, year of our lives, God, as we pray. Speak to us, please. In Christ's name, amen. Um, the message of today's Bible study, guys, is so simple and so, um, it's so typical. And there's so many in here now that this doesn't apply to that please, you that this Bible study does not apply to message-wise, let it still be a warning. May this be a red light that is fastened in your brain forever. Looking at Scripture, 16th chapter, 2 Chronicles, the continuing saga of the kingdom of David, the Davidic dynasty as they call it. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah, that he may, might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Please give me your attention. We talked about last week how there was five like extraordinary kings in the nation of Judah. Judah, Israel, two tribes, ten tribes, wicked kings, almost all of them. Mostly wicked kings down here, but there was a few good ones. The nation of Israel got into idol worship. They lost themselves completely, even though they claimed to be worshipers of Jehovah, or Yahweh, as we call him, they weren't. They just thought they were. Baasha, the king of Israel, the northern tribe, said, you know what? I'm getting tired of all these people defecting. So he built what they would call an iron curtain, if you will. And he said, no more people are leaving to go there. You understand what was happening here? People were like, man, I'm... I'm I know it's smaller. I know we got more stuff. I know we're richer. I know we've got all of the admiration of everybody around, but something they're doing down there in Judah is making people leave and go there. You guys, you understand? So he built this city. He built this wall, if you will so that people would stop going there. It was called Ramah. Then, verse 2, Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me, as there was between my father and your father. See, I have sent you gold and silver and gold. Come, break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. Again, give me your attention. Asa, this mighty man, if you guys remember, Ethiopian king came up against him with a million men. And all he did was cry out to God. Judah came against him with 800,000 men. And all he did was cry out to God. And we saw over and over again, and God struck the Israelites. And God struck uh, the Ethiopians. You guys remember? But here's what happens. Because remember, it's the 36th year. After a while, you do this thing called Christianity, and let me tell you something. It is a byproduct of this life. You get it down. And everything that you should still be doing in the spirit, you're now doing in the flesh. Your holiness is all the work of the flesh. Your Bible studies are all the work of the flesh. You're a good guy, congratulations. <laughs> You go to work, you get up, you take care of your wife. You're a good guy. 
There's much to be proud of. There's much to be happy about. But then some crazy thing happens. God does something maybe he hasn't done in a few years. He pulls the plug on your finances. He pulls the plug on your health. He pulls the plug on something. And the first thing you do, we, not you, we do as Christians, we go to our flesh and look for some fix. Let me tell you what happened here. Asa, after 36 years, after all this time of peace, after those victories which were so long ago, Baasha builds Ramah, and he goes, man, how am I going to defend this? I know what I'll do. I'm not going to bother God. I've seen God. God's already done too much in my life. You guys notice when I pray for older folks sometimes, there's no real older folks here tonight. When I pray for older folks, I always pray that the latter years will be greater than the former. That's because I see this in older folks. They think the best ministry is, ah, it's behind them, I'm kind of done. And God is not like that, man. The best ministry you have is today. It's today. I don't care how old you are. He calls the Syrian king and says, listen, I'm going to give you a bunch of money. I'm going to give you a bunch of metal. I'm going to give you a bunch of gold and silver. I'm going to do that. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to break your treaty with Israel, with the king there, and start attacking them. And that way we'll have, you know, we'll have a treaty between me and you. Now listen, keep this in mind. The one thing that you're hoping to accomplish is usually the one thing you don't accomplish. God wanted to make Syria a satellite, so to speak. They would pay tribute to Judah. But in trying to accomplish that very same thing in the flesh, they'd find out just the opposite to happen. Did anybody know what I'm talking about here? You think my rent is $1,500 a month. If I put away $5,000, I'll have enough for about three months' rent, and then I'll feel safe. <sighs> I'll be able to breathe. You work so hard in trying to accomplish that very goal only to find out two things. Number one, your security never came from the money you put away. And number two, the time that you lost working so hard, you're not going to get that back. And you might have hurt relationships. You guys understand what I'm saying? You got a gun because you don't feel safe, but now you don't feel safe because you got a gun. This is exactly what happened to this guy. He thought if he could just be pals, if he could just set something up with the guy in Syria, look what happens. Verse 4, So Ben-Hadad heeded King Asa and sent captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. They attacked Aizen, Dan, Abel, Ma'am, and all the storage cities of Naphtali. Now, it happened when Baasha heard it that he stopped building Ramah and ceased his work. Then King Asa took all Judah and they carried away the stones and timber of Ramah which Baasha used for building and with them he built Geba and Mitzpah. Please, give me your attention. I want you to, if you've never seen any of these kingdoms the way they're set up. It's kind of crazy because you have a kingdom and inside this kingdom you have like a compound where the king and all of the, uh, the royalty lives, right? And this king who's in charge, he becomes so special, and this is why God said they shouldn't have a king, that they sequester themselves and now they live on their, um, what do you call it? What do you call that when they have like a compound? What is it called? In the kingdom, the, the palace, the castle, so to speak. You know, I'll, I'll think of the word. Fortress. And they don't know what's going on out there. So he makes this, this Asa makes this treaty with the Syrian king. And Baasha, his towns get attacked now by Syria. Now, it blew me away to think about that. Number one, they're Israelites, and even though they're not walking with, with God, they're God's people, though. These are Israelites. 
And he found out that his town got attacked. Now I want to ask you a question. How would you like to find out by dialing 911 and the operator says, I'm sorry, I just don't have anybody to send out there. Wait a second. I pay my taxes. Wait a second. You take, ta I pay my, this is basically what you got here. And it's just something about it that bothered me worse than the story. It reminds me of how blessed, how grateful we should be that we dial 911. You guys remember, we, we heard the story from Victor about Espiritu Santos in, in Brazil. I, it just still, I, keep, I never can stop thinking about that. The police went on strike. What? Can, does anybody imagine that? Can you think about that? A town where the police went on strike. Where? And here's great. Government says, I don't want you to have any guns. So they limit, the amount of, they limit the amount of guns you could have. They limit the amount of ammunition you could have. They take away any ability for you to defend yourself. And then when you dial 911, they say, sorry, we can't help you. No, 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 no. So going back to the story, the whole thing reeks of lack of faith. The whole thing reeks of... You know, before I had money and I could afford a gun, I really trusted that God was going to take care of everything. Before I had any money and couldn't pay my bills, and I lived week to week, I don't know if any of you guys are still living week to week or used to live week, don't forget what that's like to live week to week. When you wake up in the morning and you have to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And you mean it. When you get up and you look out at your farm and you go, God, if you don't make a rain, my crops are going to die. If my crops die, I can't feed myself, my kids, make money for the year. I got one shot at this. Now, you guys might not know this, but one of the things that I do is I breed lizards. I breed these lizards called tegus. And now, for, for a time, if you ask my wife, that was our main source of income, you know, I since stopped putting all my quote unquote eggs in one basket. But what would happen is, guys, winter, if winter didn't get cold enough or got too cold, my lizards either died or the females wouldn't ovulate because it didn't get cold enough. So what would happen was late February roll around, it would start warming up again, and it would warm up and I'd say, is everybody's alive, good. And I'd be checking, everybody's breeding, and I'd see the females get all fat in the bottom of them, and they get ovulate. Yes, I put the males in and they breed. And I'd pray, please, no cold weather in March. And especially in April. Because once these animals breed, if it got below the 50s again, they would either absorb the, the uh, egg follicle or, or, or it would die. And they'd lay eggs. I mean, could you imagine your life? I want you to think about this. You wait all year for something to happen in April and May. And the females, she's, she's laying her eggs, and you're, okay, she's laying her eggs, good, laying her eggs. I'm gonna wait till she finishes, because if you interrupt her, she's not, you know, she, she might get mad. Sometimes they even eat their own eggs. She'd rather eat them than you take them. Yeah, it's crazy. So she finally lays the eggs. You, you try to get her before she covers up the nest because you don't want the ants to eat them. You don't want the snakes to, to, to eat the eggs. Sometimes there's these wild snakes. So there you are, and you, you lift up the, the box, and there's the eggs. Yes! You get the female out. You put her in a box. You, you, you set it up, and then you uncover the eggs. And it got too cold in March, and they're all mushy in bed. You just, I just fed this animal all year. I get one shot at this. I get one shot. fed this animal all year. Imagine how much more you'd be a praying person. If you got, and now some of you guys will feel what I'm saying now, you get that check from your boss, and you walk to the bank, please, 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 please. I know what that's like. Listen, I used to pay, I, I pay my guys on Mondays. You wanna know how that started? Because when I wrote their checks on Fridays, I didn't have the money, and I counted on the weekend to make the money to be able to pay them. And let me tell you about praying. <laughs> I, 
I didn't mind if my check wasn't good. I mean, there's many a times where I'd take two or three months of checks and just throw them out. Didn't have the money for them. We'll make it. But when your employees that work so hard for you can't cash that check, it's the worst feeling in the world. Now you think about it, again, now the reason I'm going back, the reason I told you those little stories, what kind of person of prayer would you be then? What kind of person, when, when you completely were dependent upon, don't forget those days. It's really important. Asa forgot those days, man. He forgot those days when he was in battle against a million people, and there he was, surrounded, him and his little army, and he looked out and he said, God, I know there's nothing for you, whether there's a lot or a little. And God struck those people. But a few years into it, you get lazy, you know? We don't really have to pray every single day together, do we? We don't really have to, do we have to go to church every single week? Do I have to read the Bible every, how many times are you going to read the Bible? It's the same book. I know how God works. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, I was thinking about this, telling Austin since he's become this early riser. The thing we should start doing again is, is uh, sunrise men's meetings on the beach. Isn't that a good idea? I remember being on the beach some years back, and um, there was, I, was, I was part of Calvary Fort Lauderdale, and there was like 100 guys descended on the beach at like 5 o'clock in the morning, and then 6 o'clock, the sun starts coming up, and we're praying. I'll never forget, I was with Jennerino, and, and the reason I remember is because uh, yesterday in my morning devotion, I read uh, Psalm 19, and I read Psalm 19, and I remembered whew, 17 or 18 years ago, being on the beach, and it was one of my first sunrise services with him there. It wasn't a sunrise service, it was, it was just a bunch of guys. We had a men's ministry, and a bunch of guys got together, and, and we were all praying while the sun was coming up, and... Um, I think we were worshiping. Somebody was playing the guitar. And I pointed to the, uh, to, to the scripture. And he was like, read it. Read it. And I was like, oh, read it. I don't read out loud in front of people. You know? And I remember, and I read it. Let, let me read it to you guys so you, you, you hear. So the sun's coming up around us, guys. I'm turning the wrong direction. The sun was coming up. We were all tired, greasy, nasty. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth and the words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run his race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Man, I remember I read that on the beach 17 plus years ago as the sun was coming up and I never forgot it. I never forgot it. Now, every time I read that, I remember that day. I don't ever want to forget where I've come from spiritually. I never want to forget. Now, hopefully that's the message that you guys get when I'm preaching this word every week, and the reason I, I preach it with so much of my heart, the reason I preach it with so much of my life, the reason I, you think I want you guys to know my personal business? I don't. Sometimes my wife and kids say, why do you share so much about our lives? I, I don't know. I got to hope that somehow, some way, something we're going through is going to help somebody else. I guess. I'm afraid to get to heaven and find out. He said, stupid. You shouldn't have told everybody so much about yourself.
I, this, this section of scripture breaks my heart. And it gives me encouragement also, because at the end you're going to find out Asa really screwed up, but Asa was still a really good king. And it gives me hope too, because there's a lot of people like my pastor. You know, God knows what's going to happen in the end, and whether he should repent or not repent of, of, of anything's going on in his life. And I do pray that, that in heaven he, he turns out to be a great pastor. Yeah, you had a, you had a rough patch, but you did good work for so long. Let's, let's just hold on to that in heaven. You guys know what I'm saying? But continuing. So he takes all the stuff. He has the king of Syria attack them in verse 5. Then Asa goes there to this town that he was going to build to keep the people back. And he goes and takes all this stuff and builds his own cities with it. Verse 7. And at that time, Hanani, the seer, or the prophet, you can write next to that, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria, and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Again, remember what I said? Syria could have been your vassal. He could have been your servant. Now you're his. He could have been indebted to you. You could have destroyed him. But now... You have to pay him. You blew it. Son, you blew it. You see that, guys? You see what he says? The seer comes to him. Now, a tender heart. David had a tender heart. You guys remember the story? Bathsheba, prophet Nathan comes to him and said, you screwed up big time, son. You messed up big time. You remember what happened right after that? You can read Psalm 51 at home. That's what happened right after he got confronted. He wrote Psalm 51. Most amazing forgiveness. If you ever don't know how to ask God to forgive you, read Psalm 51. <laughs> you find all the forgiveness in that you need. Verse 8, Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Wow. Did you guys just read that? You want a tattoo verse? You want a memory verse? If you all don't have this, mem this verse memorized, I pity you. I, re I remember the first time I read this verse and I was like, what? What did I just read? Reading the Old Testament's amazing because you, you, you look on it in so many levels. So many levels, and at one point in time, you're looking for these gems. You, you're, you're like, reading the Old Testament is like mining. It's like mining. You're, you're, you're wading through these stories and these genealogies, and all of a sudden, chit, 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 chit. I found one. This is it. Let me read that to you again. You can close your eyes and let it wash over you. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Man. If you're weak, if you're low, if you have an insurmountable mountain in front of you, if there's an army encamped against you, here the Bible just said that God's eyes are looking for somebody who's in a jam, who's in a pickle, who's in a bad place, that he can show himself strong on your behalf. Man. But you know where he can't show himself strong on behalf of? Somebody who calls the Syrian army, someone who takes out a loan, somebody who, you know, fill in the blanks of the, what you've done in the flesh that God said, no, we can do it in the spirit. The Bible says a few really interesting things. First of all, he said that when the, when the flesh is, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. What God has begun in the spirit, you cannot make perfect in the flesh. It's a crazy thing, this flesh, this, this jar of clay we live in, guys. It's a crazy thing. You would think, going by the outside, that the more we've seen God do in our lives, the stronger our faith would go. But it seems like the more God does in our lives, the weaker our flesh gets. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I'm saying. 
Hmm. And I love the, the latter part of this verse that I wouldn't get a, the rest of it tattooed on me. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. Man, isn't it crazy to think that this guy did one screw up, so for the rest of his life he's got to deal with war? One screw up. Man, it just, he did so many great things. He just screwed up once. But when you're responsible for other people, your actions must be chosen carefully. You can't screw up, not even once. If you're a boss, if you're a father, if you're a mother, listen, there's forgiveness by God. I mean, you think about that because that's always the thing. Bible always, yeah, people always talk about that to say, you know, God doesn't judge one sin from another, right? No, he doesn't. He can forgive all sin, but, but man ain't like that. <laughs> you can go out and murder somebody, and God will forgive you if you ask him to forgive you. But man ain't. You're still going to have to do your time. You follow? This guy still had to do his time. And, and the crazy thing is, watch what he does here. Am I losing you guys? Are you not with me? Are you feeling this thing or not? You with me? Because I feel like I'm losing some of y'all. Okay. Verse 10, <laughs> then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison, for he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Now, at first you think to yourself, man, that's, well, that's typical of the kings. Not Asa. Asa was a great king. He wasn't a good king. He was a great king. But after 30 some odd years, you know what? Don't tell me what to do. Man, I never want to be like that. I always want to be the guy that can receive. You know how many people come to me and they're going to tell me? Man, I just, you know, before I go up, oh, really, you're going to tell me? You know how long I, let me see if there might be something in here for me first. Before I get all bowed up. You know, because when you're a pastor, everybody has their opinion. Dude showed up to me a couple weeks ago. Tell me how to run church. I'm like, excuse me, who are you again? Have you come to our church before? Have you? Went to get my, uh, my head shaved last week. And this is the craziest thing, guys. Hopefully somebody knows what I'm talking about. I sit down in the chair, and it's my buddy Dave. He's been, he's been shaving my head since I started shaving my head 20 years ago. Before, I, my, my hair was gray. I only found out that I had gray hair because I forgot to shave my head. I'm serious. It's like, hey. So I sit down in a chair, and there's a girl, a blonde woman, yeah, maybe f late 30s, sitting next to me. And, and, and she turns around, she looks at me, and she goes, hello. I was like, hi. It's like, oh, is she hitting on me? She said, aren't you that pastor from Calvary Chapel, Deerfield Beach? I said, yes, I am. She goes, I'll go to your church sometimes. She had this either South African or British accent. I couldn't tell what it was. I looked at her and I go, I am so embarrassed that I do not recognize you. She said, well, I pop in in the back and I sit there with my kids. Uh, my husband has them sometimes. and some, You know, she goes to this whole, I was like, I never ever want this to happen to me. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? A little blonde girl says she has a couple, you know who she that's exactly right. Did she tell you that she saw me get my head shaved? No. Did she? <laughs> chip, chip, cheerio, governor. <laughs> you don't say, governor. <laughs> so what's the story with her? What do you say? She says to me, she looks at me and, and, and sincerely she says to me, when you talk, my heart moves. You, you, you always say the most sincere things, and every time I've been there, my life has changed. I was like, oh, I don't even know your name. Yeah, she did say her name was Nikki, though. But I just, I never want you guys to forget 
when you speak the word. I sent out, you guys that, that are on my, my verse chain, the verse I sent out today. Um, does anybody remember it? It was Colossians 4, but the exact... Huh? Yeah, but the exact verbiage was like, you had to read it a few times before you get it. You got it up, Jim? Please. Nice accent. <laughs> Got me down. You, you see, it said that, read, read, read the first part again. First verse? The, the first, yeah. Walk in wisdom to those who are outside. Walk in wisdom to those who are outside. Redeeming the time. And then let your, let your speech Always be with grace, seasoned with salt. I never memorized that verse. I don't remember that verse like ever sticking out at me before. I mean, it's Colossians, so I probably read it a dozen times. But I read it, and it's like, I, I don't, what does that mean? And the more I read it, I was like, you know, because usually if I'm outside in the world and I'm not in the church, I'm not as careful with my speech. I'm kind of looser with it because I could be a, a little bit of a witness, and it'll be just as good. At least I'm not huffing and cussing and puffing, you know what I mean? But here, the verse actually says, you know what I want you to do? I want you to go the other way. I want you to be even more careful when you're out there. Redeem the time. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. Man, I, I, I don't do that. I, I was convicted by that word. I'm not. I'm, I'm the guy, <laughs> that's a funny joke, you know? You want to hear a good joke? Here. <laughs> I got a funny joke for you. I don't want to do that. Even a little bit. You, you with me? You understand what I'm saying, though? Why this spoke to me? Because I thought a little bit of witness is better than no witness at all. And God just goes, every single time he goes the other way with me. He goes, no, a bolder witness is better. Yeah, but if I'm not as... Yeah. Yep. When I grow hard-hearted and I can't hear what other people have to say to me, <laughs> you know what the hard thing about doing business with people in churches, guys? And the hard thing about being a businessman in churches, you have to handle yourself on a different level. It can't be business as usual. I got this woman now that comes to our church once in a while. She's doing our roof at the house. And for her, you know, she's, she's, I don't know if she's brand new to church, I don't know what the situation is, but sometimes they show up, sometimes they don't show up. Yeah, we're going to be finished tomorrow. Yeah, we're going to be finished tomorrow. Yeah, we're going to be finished tomorrow. But I can't, I can't do what I normally do. I go, it's okay, you know, it's cool when you get there. Is everything okay? You can't go into, into like, you know, business mode. Well, I, I have every right to go into business mode. She's not done the job that she promised. You know, the, the roof's not on. The, 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 there's leaks in the building. You know, I, I should very well be able to. Okay, what if I do and she leaves? That's her fault. She should have been a better business person. <laughs> David's going through it now. David put some kid on the church, put, put some kid on the payroll, his front part of the church, and now he's trying to figure out, you know, Kid's not really a good worker. What do I do here, Ryan? Man, you, you, you treat him like a man. You treat him with respect. Because as a boss, here's what happens. If you have a, a, an employee who you don't like, the first thing you do is you distance yourself from him. That way you don't get emotionally involved. Then when he gets your own mad, good and mad, you just go, you know what? Goodbye. That's what I've done. I've done it hundreds of times. You know what? Better off, go get another job. And then the ministry's lost, but who cares? I don't have to deal with this guy. But now in his business, though, and it's ministry, and it's church. You got to give them a bunch of chances. 
you got to suck it up through the junk and hope that in your heart, in your brain, ministry is more important than money. And the person's soul is more important than his work ethic. Anybody want to trade places? <laughs> it ain't no joke when you're in ministry and you find out that it ain't what you thought it was. And now all of a sudden, ministry and business clash. And this is what happened with Asa, guys. This is not a story I'm just telling you. This is not some ornate story I'm telling you. This is what happened with Asa. Asa got used to doing business as usual. You know what? This guy's there. Let's build this. Let's do this. Let's have him do this. Whoa, 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 whoa. Asa, don't forget about God. Too busy. I, I know how God works. God's already done. God's already done what he's going to do in my life. I'm too old. I'm too, I'm too crotchy. I, I don't have to worry about God anymore. So Asa gets a seer sent to him, a prophet, and the prophet says to him, Dude, you're, you're, you're messed up. Asa doesn't do what David does and go, I'm so sorry. I bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that was in me. I've done wrong. I've done wickedly. No. He goes, you know what? You're going to jail. And everybody that knows you, I'm going to beat them up. That's what he does. Asa was angry with the seer, put him in prison, for he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Verse 11 Note that the acts of Asa, first and last, are indeed written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. Yet in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. And he let the hardness of his heart and the mistakes of his old age harden him more and more and more. And then what happens is, guys, and here you can write this one down in your in your knower somewhere. The further you stay away from God, the further you want to be from God. The more you let that crustiness grow over your heart, the less repent. You ever see some old guy on his deathbed? You guys that do the convalescent home, you meet these people, and they either have a cross in their room, or they tell you about the ministry, but they're hard-hearted. They don't want to soften their heart. They don't want to break. They, you know what happens. When God breaks your heart, it's a dam. And the water flows. You know what I'm saying? And the water flows, those tears. Oh, man. So here he's... Now, now he wasn't saying here that it is bad to call the doctors when, you're, when your feet are... When, when you have a disease. Not bad at all. But don't ever forget the healing comes from God. He made your body to heal, right? I know I'm throwing a lot at you guys tonight. I know it. I know it. Verse 13, so Asa rested with his fathers. He died in the 30, 41st year of his reign. They buried him in his own tomb, which he had made for himself in the city of David. And they laid him in a bed which was filled with spices, various ingredients prepared in a mixture of ointments. They made a very great burning for him. Now that very great burning, just so you know, that is not a... Um, a uh, uh, Cremation, yeah, that's not an okay of cremation. That burning means that they lit lots and lots and lots of candles. It's actually a very technical term in the Hebrew. It does not mean that the Bible okays cremation or anything like that. Not that um, you find anywhere that you shouldn't cremate. Please don't think that. But that's not the, see, that's why I cremate. Don't use that verse in an in a, in a, um, irresponsible way either. Now, I want you to know that this section of Scripture is used by a lot of people who do not... Um, who think the Bible is full of contradictions because in the very first, um, very first verse it says Jehoshaphat, in the first verse of 17, it's Jehoshaphat reigned in this place. There's a three year overlap. And when you do the math in the genealogies, there's three years missing from the reign between Jehoshaphat, his son, who also happens to be a great king, we'll read about him in a couple weeks, and Asa. And the reason is, and this is what happens you have what Chuck Missler calls higher criticisms. When you hear people who want to tell you why the Bible isn't real and they do it in this very condescending tone in a matter to suggest that, um, well, uh, the Bible is a good book, but here's one of the reasons why. The Bible talks about camels and horses, and in the third century there was no camels and horses in the Middle East. They weren't imported there until such and such year. And, and you're like, no, that's not accurate. Who, who told you that? 
well, the reason that the Bible's not real is because in the book of Genesis it said that Adam bit into an apple, and we know that apples can't grow in those hot environments. Like, no, it doesn't say he bit into an apple. It says he bit into a fruit. Well, here's why the Bible isn't real, because Asa in such and such B.C., and, and then Jehoshaphat in such and such B.C., well, how does that make sense? Well, because he, when he got sick in his feet, he let his son reign in his place, and they were what's called co-regents for three years. And that makes up the three-year difference. Oh, well, I, I still don't believe the Bible. Well, I know. You're not going to believe the Bible anyway. And you're just looking for excuses not to believe the Bible. Instead of looking at this amazing verse that says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro across the whole earth, looking to show him so strong on behalf of a heart as loyal well to him. No, you're more interested in the three years that are missing. When God could rescue your life, and repair your family and heal your broken heart, you're more interested in three years missing from some co-regents. You guys understand? Well, how does that happen? Remember, the first thing, don't let this happen to you. Look, and I don't use their names as a way to, um, to steal their, their, their glory, but I look around this room at my brothers that I've known for so many years, especially you younger leaders in here, I'm going to tell you something. Bill, John, even Luigi, Jim, myself, we've been hearing the Word of God preached for 20 some odd years. And they sit, when I hear a good preacher, I'm at the edge of my seat. I'm in tears half the time. Never lose that. Never, ever lose the ability for a tender heart. To... Marty's probably heard this. How many times have you heard this section of Scripture taught? Just at the end. Speak something new to me. Man, don't, don't. I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Pastor Stefan Chavidjian, I heard teach this section of scripture for the first time going back 20 years ago, and his, he titled it, Don't Be an Asa. And his message... <laughs> See what I did? Did you just get that early? <laughs> it's my blonde daughter. And the whole message of don't, don't being an Asa is this. Keep that tender heart. Don't ever let it, don't ever think you know what God's got planned for you today. Don't ever think you know. I don't care how many days in a row God has done the same thing. You wake up tomorrow and wondering if he's going to do something new. Always get, get that word. <sighs> God, guys, Last thing, God changed my heart the other day. I mean, God completely changed my heart the other day. You know, um, I, was, I was in Scripture, and, um, and God said, and I think I sent this verse out to you. God said, admonish each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And I looked up the word admonish, and it literally said, rebuke, correct, take to task, drag over the coals. Like now, I know how to do all that stuff, but I don't know how to do all that stuff when psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And then I went to my verse in Colossians, the last verse, and it said, Husbands, don't be embittered to your wives. And the Lord, man, he, he punched me right here. He said, You're embittered to your wife, and you're admonishing her with your flesh, not in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. How many times are you going to do this to me? And he said, hopefully forever. But you can't, you know, some of you, oh, I've read that verse. It's, well, I just read it for the first time then because I never saw it like that. How do you admonish somebody in song? Let the Bible change your life every single day. It'll do it forever, forever. Guys, this is like my fourth study Bible. Every day, and I'm still every day searching, just 
digging it. There's got to be a nugget in there somewhere. I ain't busting through my, my, my Bible study time and just, man, just get through it, get out of here. Got a lot of work to do. I got to get through it. That's what happened to Asa. Not going to happen to me. Remember that, that saying from uh, the Little Rascals? I like to quote the Little Rascals. Might choke Artie, but it won't choke me. Might choke Asa, ain't going to choke me. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, um, we give you our hard hearts because your word says um, that you will take our hard heart and you replace it with a heart of flesh. So do it. And if it takes our finances, the ransom of a man's life is his riches. If it takes our, our health, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If it takes our relationships, that you came to bring a sword. Whatever it takes, God, may, may our heart never grow hard enough to, to hate the messenger. May it be your word that always has free reign and rule in our hearts. May our, may our very veins pump your blood through us forever. I think about Tony right now, and I think about Lynette. I think about those who have gone before us just these last couple of years. God, they did so good. It was such an honor to know them, God. May we do the same. May we live for you as you died for us. We love you and pray these things so that your glory and your kingdom and your power are furthered. Amen. Amen.